Thank you. Um, let me begin by uh, thanking IDSA and uh, in particular Ambassador Sood for inviting me today uh, to make this presentation. I want to also, like Bruno, talk about a few uh, major trends, uh, but I'll confine it to five <laughs> instead of seven. But, uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, we'll see at the end of it whether it's better or not. But uh, the, the first major trend that I'll talk about uh, is, uh, I, again, uh, most of the trends that I'm talking about are very similar to what the previous two speakers have, uh, have said. Um, uh, there's nothing dramatically new uh, in what I'm going to say. Um, the first major trend is what I would suggest is a rationalization of nuclear forces in the post after the end of the Cold War. Uh, by this I mean that nuclear forces more uh, matched to the task of deterrence rather than becoming, uh, rather than being a consequence of an arms race spiraling. Uh, this is particularly true obviously in the case of the United States and the Soviet Union uh, and of course this trend began prior to the Cold War, uh, prior to the end of the Cold War uh, with, the arms, with the nuclear arms control measures between, uh, between the two countries. Uh, but uh, the, the reduction, I don't think we should minimize the level of reduction that has happened. I mean, something, for, you know, the U.S. had to speak had something like 30,000 nuclear warheads. The, the, so, the Soviet Union during the Cold War peak had something like 40,000 nuclear warheads. And both of them are down now to uh, about 4,000 to 5,000. Uh, including uh, reserve stocks. I think that's a significant uh, number in terms of the reductions. Um, so that is one aspect of the, of the rationalization of, of the nuclear forces. The second aspect of that rationalization is that uh, other nuclear powers have not necessarily taken advantage or bucked that trend. Uh, in other words, Britain and France uh, similarly have also reduced uh, roughly about uh, almost half of their uh, nuclear arsenals from their Cold War highs of about 500 to about 200 to 300 uh, in, their, in their respective cases. And China has remained fairly stable at around uh, 200, 250. We don't, we don't know how many exactly, obviously, for the Chinese case, uh, of which uh, less than, um, only a couple of dozen, uh, a few dozen are actually strategic weapons. Uh, more, more, more of them are sub-strategic. Uh, there have been, of course, been some prediction about the growth in Chinese nuclear arsenals since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we've been hearing about this for 20 years. Uh, has it happened yet? Uh, even though, uh, of, of course, anything that you say about Chinese nuclear forces, one has to be careful about because of the limited information that we have. But nevertheless, it has not. It has also not bucked that trend, as far as we know. Uh, the other nuclear powers, Israel, uh, India, Pakistan, all have uh, somewhat, uh, have also remained fairly stable. Israel has been around, uh, around again, we don't know for sure, but uh, roughly around 100, let's say, 100, 150. Uh, India and Pakistan have grown, uh, but it has been a fairly slow growth. I mean, it's, uh, it's grown by about two or three uh, warheads uh, per year, so roughly both have around 100 uh, each and so the, the early expectations in 1998 if you go back and read some of the some of the expectations at that point of time about how rapidly this was going to change and how how much of an arms race there was going to be hasn't really happened so in a sense uh, though though india and pakistan nuclear force have grown a little bit unlike the others uh, nevertheless it has it has uh, also not been um, uh, not been an arms race spiral as such uh, the rationalization is not just about the numbers, but also in terms of reducing some of the most dangerous of these weapons, which are uh, obviously the, the sub-strategic weapons, particularly tactical nuclear weapons. The U.S. has reduced over 90 percent of its, um, uh, Arvind is right in terms of pointing out that there's still a significant number, several hundred left, but uh, if you compare with what was there in 1990 or 1991, there's been a significant reduction in tactical nuclear weapons over 90 percent, Russia is over 70, 70 75 percent. Uh, and again, other powers haven't really bucked this trend. Uh, China, uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, the only, only, only case where there is an increasing uh, emphasis on tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons might be in the case of Pakistan, where obviously we have seen in the recent past uh, some emphasis on the Pakistani, on the Pakistani side. And uh, on a few of these trends, clearly Pakistan uh, does represent an outlier. But outside of that, uh, we do have that same uh, same sort of trend continuing. Will this will this continue? I mean, I would expect that uh, that this trend would trend towards rationalization would continue because I think there is a fairly broad recognition of uh, the fact that you don't need huge numbers to deter. 
uh, and that uh, part of that uh, massive growth in the you know, tens of thousands of warheads during the Cold War was uh, the consequence of the arms race spiral uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and that uh, even if the uh, even if we were to emerge into a much more in much more competitive international environment, I do not expect uh, that these numbers would uh, go dramatically up. I would not expect that to be reflected in the numbers of nuclear weapons. The second major contradiction, uh, second sort of major trend is in contradiction to this uh, of the rationalization of nuclear forces uh, is the greater emphasis on nuclear deterrence per se and this is uh, similar to what Bruno was talking about as the sort of the two different trends in two different parts, uh, two different parts of the world. Uh, that is, in some parts of the world, uh, there is greater emphasis on nuclear deterrence. This includes uh, South Asia, but also in the future could include East Asia and, and the Middle East. A number of reasons for, uh, for this uh, emphasis on nuclear deterrence. Um, one is that uh, there has been uh, a breakdown in the consensus, the great power consensus on nuclear proliferation, on the non-proliferation regime which means in a sense that there is greater uh, you know, uh, incentive or uh, p possibility of countries acquiring nuclear weapons uh, and you can see that a little bit in the North Korean and, uh, and the Iranian cases. Um, both China and Russia seem to think uh, of uh, the non-proliferation talks, especially with these two countries or non-proliferation in general as a way of soft balancing against the United States and this, this, that would have obviously further potential for spreading nuclear weapons. The second uh, reason for uh, this is that, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but uh, the, the destabilization uh, of conventional military balances uh, because of uneven national growth, that is, you know, in both, in both in the South Asian case as well as the East Asian case, there is India's rapid growth, China's rapid growth has sort of unbalanced the conventional, existing conventional balance to, to some extent in those regions. And this has also increased regional insecurity leading to a greater emphasis on nuclear deterrence in, in both in East Asia and in the, in the case of South Asia vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Uh, this could potentially happen also in the Gulf region if, for example, Iran were to rejoin uh, the international community, um, become a normal state and, and, and it were, if it were to uh, become much more stronger. Um, so all of that uh, leads to a greater emphasis on nuclear The third element that increases that uh, emphasis, I think, is uh, increasing doubts about U.S. extended deterrence commitments. And part of this is, of course, maybe temporary, maybe the Obama effect, maybe change after 2016, depending on where that goes. Uh, but also some, some more secular trends, which is the relative long-term decline of the United States, uh, especially with China, especially increase, especially as it increases East Asian anxiety about uh, the effect of uh, about the about the uh, about uh, U.S. extended deterrence commitments, uh, if the U.S. were to continue to weaken or over the long term become more isolationist, this could obviously uh, be one of the possible um, uh, could increase incentives for states to uh, acquire nuclear weapons, Japan, South Korea, uh, and other other countries, uh, because the, ch the choices they would face is either bad bargaining with China or or acquiring uh, nuclear weapons, and that, that, is, uh, that is one uh, possibility. Uh, the third trend uh, flowing from the above uh, is an increasing emphasis on nuclear weapons as a compensation for, uh, as a compensatory device for conventional military, military, military weaknesses. And of obviously this has precedence, uh, NATO in Central Europe is one, Pakistan today is another. Uh, but this does increase to some extent uh, the risk of a nuclear deterrence doctrines and potentially could lead to greater crisis instability. Um, uh, using tactical nuclear weapons, relying on tactical, tactical nuclear weapons, I mean there is a whole set of reasons as to why that increases, uh, increases the risk um, that I'm sure everybody knows, I mean in terms of moving nuclear weapons forward to the, towards the border, to have ready nuclear forces, a pre-delegated nuclear use authority, increasing risk of theft or unauthorized use, or greater crisis instability, all of this set of reasons that we know uh, that might make this uh, a, a more uh, dangerous trend. Uh, a fourth trend, uh, including um, uh, a fourth trend, is what I would call nuclear distractions, um, which is uh, you know two major nuclear distractions. One is nuclear terrorism, and another one is missile defences. Uh, nuclear terrorism, obviously, uh, you know, low probability but high impact, as it were, 
Um, and no real solution other than uh, we've had obviously just a nuclear security summit that just ended, but uh, increased increasing uh, security and physical security and so on and so forth. But in, increase the greater focus uh, at least amongst countries about how to deter uh, terrorism and nuclear terrorism and so on and so forth. The second uh, is uh, missile defenses. Um, a greater interest over the last 10, 15 years, uh, 20 years. Um, and obviously, uh, that is part of the, you know, the, the Scud Scouts Act, as it were, the, in, in the spread of uh, ballistic missiles in various parts of the world. And this also, again, has unpredictable consequences um, to, uh, as far as deterrence, deterrence goes and crisis, crisis stability goes, um, uh, for a variety of reasons that, <coughs> again, are well known. A final fifth, uh, the fifth trend, the final trend is relates to the salience of nuclear weapons uh, and the international political order. Without necessarily being a determinist, one could clearly see the impact of, uh, of uh, international political circumstances, the structural circumstances uh, on arms race and arms control. Uh, clearly, the, 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 the nature of nuclear forces that, that were built uh, during the Cold War had a lot to do with the bipolar nature of that competition. Um, but also uh, the, that bipolarity also impacted on the creation of nuclear norms because there was a significant consensus among great powers about uh, about nuclear non-proliferation that that led to that uh, led to that nuclear po part of the nuclear order. Uh, unipolarity has had its own impact. Yeah, thank you. Uh, unipolarity has had its own impact uh, in terms of uh, the spread of nuclear weapons because obviously uh, one of the key reasons for uh, the North Korean and Iranian nuclear pursuits. Uh, have to do not so much with the regional, uh, not entirely with the regional uh, regional element as much as with the pressure that they felt from the United States. So, so in a sense, uh, the, that that impact you can see uh, the unipolar impact you can see uh, in terms of both uh, both uh, uh, in terms of these countries, but also in, even in terms of the Indian decision to test in 1998. Even though obviously we went nuclear. Uh, at least a decade earlier, but uh, the, the the NPT, uh, indefinite extension of the NPT, the CTBT, all the factors in India's decision, and all of that had to do uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the unipolar structure. So if, if if we are to move towards a multipolar structure, uh, I would argue that uh, that uh, the current um, uh, it would also impact on on nuclear weapons and deterrence. The current non-proliferation no norms could become diluted, could make could become uh, nuclear weapons could become much more uh, attractive, and uh, therefore, in a sense, if we if we are moving down the same trend, uh, despite the rhetoric on nuclear disarmament, I would argue that the salience of nuclear deterrence will actually increase. Thank you. Mm -hmm.